Gary, thanks for coming on to us. Yes, thank you so much, Mary, for tuning in. Now, as we mentioned there, it's Climate Action Week. And you just recently came back from New York. You were there at a protest to end fossil fuel usage. What makes you still want to get involved and get your feet on the ground for movements like that, Mary? I think it was important as chair of the elders to be part of a protest about the need to get out of fossil fuels. But what I was also emphasizing was we must do it with just transition. And if you will bear with me, can I just explain a little bit? Uh, there are two types of just transition. The just transition out of fossil fuel and the just transition into affordable, accessible, renewable energy. And both require resources. Uh, we, we, we have a just transition in Ireland for getting out of turf, out of peat. And uh, you know there's money being spent in the Midlands to try and help communities there. Uh, we need much more talk about that. But also we need affordable renewable energy, affordable steps to get us where we need to be. Um, and you, of course, are urging the Irish government to end its use of fossil fuels. But when you say they're, they're spending this money, are you optimistic that we will actually see that happen in the next decade? Or, or what do you think the timeline even looks like for that? The timeline is very acute. Um, lots of things are happening. You know, renewable energy is genuinely becoming a lot cheaper and the battery retention is a lot better. And if we only believed fully in it, which we must, uh, we could move even more faster. But there's a resistance from a huge lobby of fossil fuels. I mean, they, they spend about four billion a year trying to prolong fossil fuels, mess with the science, convince us you know, that fossil fuel is needed to tackle poverty and all these arguments. But actually, the scientists, and I follow the scientists, they tell us that we have probably only six to seven years to really make a major turnaround. So uh, that's why I get out on marches. That's why the elders are uh, really uh, trying to say we have a climate and nature crisis, which means we have to have a crisis mentality to deal with it. Wow, six or seven years, that is a staggering fact. But when it comes yeah. to climate action, Mary, communities acting together plays a major role and you're very passionate about communities coming together. Why, where has that passion come from? Well, I think it's all about communities. It's all about all of society, not just governments now. It's climate and nature. So whatever we can do to regenerate, farmers are vital. Uh, whatever we can do to uh, make sure that people have... Um, warm homes without using too much energy. In other words, um, we're able to help people to retrofit. Um, we must uh, try and move really rapidly to electric vehicles, electric trains, electric buses. Um, we must do everything we can. And there's a resistance on the fossil fuel side that we have to you know, understand is stopping us from moving as fast. And it's communities that are vital because of communities have that sense of crisis that I'm talking about, that will penetrate up to governments. In many ways, democratic governments are treating climate as a serious issue we need to deal with. That's not good enough. It's not a serious issue we have to deal with. It's a crisis. It's a crisis for humanity. So we have to get very real about it. And I think communities can help enormously. Um, the last time you were on, uh, Mary, you spoke about the gender disparity between men and women when it came to uh, climate change. Um, tell us about the work that you do with your foundation, the uh, Dandel Project Dandelion, I should say. Yeah, I'm, I'm stepping up so you can see my badge of Project Dandelion, which I'm very proud of. Um, I think this is a moment in time, believe, believe it or not, when women leaders at all levels have to step up. Political women leaders, business women leaders, community women leaders, indigenous women leaders, young women leaders um, have to step up because this goes beyond politics. It goes beyond anything. So no matter what you're doing to help your community, prioritize climate somehow in it, the climate and nature crisis. Make it part of you know, your own way of expressing things so our voice will become louder, so we can gather together not just women leaders, it's women led I'm hoping for, but not women only. We want to get everybody, business leaders, um, everybody who's on the right side of what we need to do. It's a huge, um, it's sort of almost David and Goliath now because we're not spending four billion a year slowing things down like the fossil fuel lobby is. 
So somehow we have to use our people power to speak out at every level, in every way, because it's that urgent. We can see the climate shocks. I'm sure you know your, your viewers know there are climate shocks happening all over the world. Yeah, and we're seeing some um, horrific images here of climate change. And too often, Mary, people think that climate change only affects places really far away. But in 2023, it's kind of realities on our front doorstep yeah. where Portugal had wildfires, for instance, New York had flooding. July 2023 was the hottest month ever recorded in history. Mm -hmm. So like that's really staggering and really thought provoking. But mm -hmm. do you think that's going to mm -hmm. wake us up, Mary, and we, we will start realizing yes. that we need to act now? And I would add to that because I had the direct experience. I had two mandates from the then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon about climate. The first one was before the Paris Climate Agreement. The second one was in 2016. I was asked to come back as a special envoy of the Secretary General on El Nino and climate. Sadly, we're in another El Nino year. I can't tell you how serious that is. Um, El Nino is a natural formation of countries like Peru, um, and it, it heats up the world in certain respects. So 2016 is the hottest year until this year. 2023 is now the hottest year. Believe me, 2024 will be hotter. Heat kills people. Heat is terrible when it's unlivable, as it is when you get up to 40, 45, 50, 50 degrees. Flooding is terrible too, but heat is um, something that really, and in fact, what, what El Nino does, it exas exacerbates all the trends. So you'll have more flooding and more heat. But 2024 will be the hottest year there ever. And we have to be very careful because we've already gone above 1.5 just a few times. And um, we must remember that we have to keep pointing out we have to stay below 1.5 permanently, which means more effort to really get there. Mary, uh, it's so tough watching the news at the moment. I, I yeah. actually can't remember a more horrific time to tune into the news yeah. headlines. So when we are yeah. talking about uh, climate action and we want, you know, the next generation to inherit this better, safer world, when we are seeing the horrific scenes of yeah. the war in the Middle East, like uh, when we're thinking about what effects it'll have on even the children that managed to survive what's happening there, can you see, slightly moving off topic, but can you see a peaceful resolution between Israel and Palestine? It's a very difficult time. I think it will help if we recognize the trauma for both communities. We mustn't gloss over now how devastating it was for Israelis to have that, those terrible attacks. They are war crimes, crimes against humanity. Our Irish people fully understand the oppression of the Palestinian people, and we acknowledge that. But we mustn't confuse it with, you know, really speaking out about the trauma for the Israeli people. Um, in, in the, in those, and now we have what's happening in Gaza, which is, it's hard to watch. I, I, I find myself in tears sometimes, I just, in frustration. We have to bring this to an end as quickly as possible. I hope that President Biden will speak privately to Netanyahu about it's his fault in many ways that it's got so bad. Not that um, there would be these war crimes in response, which is what Hamas has done. Hamas has deliberately uh, tried to provoke Israel as much as possible for political reasons. Let's be, and make no mistake about that. that. That savagery was very deliberate. Let's make no mistake about that. So it's a very difficult situation for us all to try and navigate. And, and then we have this other war against, you know, in Ukraine. Tomorrow I leave for Kyiv again to go back as chair of the elders to another conference and working group on what's happening in Ukraine. We mustn't forget about that as well. So, you know, it's, it's not an easy time. But of course, um, hope is action. You know, by taking action, by doing the right thing, you bring hope. Of course, you would just mention it there, hope, and it is very overwhelming hearing all this, and especially coming yeah. from you, Mary. Mm -hmm. But for future generations, I know you're very passionate about the world for future generations. Yeah. Is there hope for us and, and younger? Well, when I talk to young people, I get such hope. Um, they're very smart, they're very connected. They actually have an idealism. Uh, they're not as cynical as, as later in life. Um, and I, I think that idealism of young people is what we really need. Um, we need uh, to believe in and work for. And actually, um, the reason I want women to lead is I want a feminist future. 
It's um, largely the alpha male um, military approach, a capitalism approach, et cetera, which is, has us where we are. If we can have women leading with our cooperation, with our listening, with our you know, sense of um, radical collaboration now to get us out of this difficulty, I think it will help a lot. So women, young and old, everywhere you are, in your community, even if you think I'm not an important person, you are. And step up, women in particular. We have a show full of leaders, we, female sorry, leaders. Sorry, formidable so women on tonight's yeah. show. Mary, you say you get hope when you speak to young people. And honestly, you would give us hope listening to you tonight. Thank you so much. It's actually a, a comfort to, to listen to your words this evening. Thank you so much, Mary Robinson, for joining us tonight so on much. the 6 o'clock show. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so nice. Wow. She's packed schedule as well. Like, it's yeah, so lovely to get time incredible. with her. We really appreciate it. Yeah.